And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you happen to be watching this particular presentation. This is AJS 225 Introduction to Criminology, and I am your facilitator, Mr. Saya. So we're going to we're going to take up where we left off on Tuesday. We're going to talk about various biological and psychological theories. Now, when you're watching these theories, keep in mind that these theories are oftentimes the products of the events that occurred in in the world at the time. Now we talked a little bit you know, on Tuesday about various theories such as uh, the saturation theory or or social Darwinism or even atavism that Lombroso had pointed out. Now keep in mind that at the time the instrumentation that was available for these for these various theories was pretty primitive. I mean it wasn't necessarily as advanced as it was in uh, the current day. So these theories may not necessarily have currency. Or do they? Some of the things that we're finding out, for example, about Lombroso's theory is that is that they Cesare Lombroso may have actually had something to talk about. That he may have actually had some some basis in fact, but it was just his instrumentation that was primitive, and it very well could be that over maybe the next fifty years, when our instrumentation finally becomes sensitive enough, that maybe we'll find out that Lombroso was wrong. But we'll see. Time will tell. But with that said, let's take up where we left off. We talked about Sheldon's somatotypes and how uh, certain somatotypes were, in Sheldon's view, predictive of personality and behavior. And Sheldon believed that big people were going to be were going to be happy and and uh, would generally be jolly and get along with people, whereas people who were who were extremely thin were often very nervous, uh, very frail people. But people in the middle, the mesomorphs, the ones who were, to use our current language, buff, were oftentimes violent and thrill-seeking. Now, again, given the instrumentation of the time, what and what Sheldon used was a camera primarily. And he probably asked these subjects a few questions about about what sort of behavior they engaged in. And so, as a result, that, that was how he came to his conclusions. Now, the, having said all that, that, that brings us to biological theories. Now, the critique of many early biological theories is that these theories suggest that Genetics was the root of all behavior, and that people who were of uh, of low of low evolutionary uh, standing were basically not well developed enough, and therefore exhibited uh, behaviors that were antisocial. Now the problem is, is that the variables in these various things were pretty weakly operationalized. In other words, they were weakly defined. Look at Cesare Lombroso. What he did was he took his camera into a men's prison, a women's prison, and a military base. And his variables were operationalized as criminal or not criminal man or woman. Those were those, that was primarily his variables. And he just took pictures and of course everybody in the prison was there because they were criminal. And so he drew certain conclusions that were pro that probably wouldn't stand up today because again it wasn't exactly a scientifically rigorous study. Although we did try using the scientific method. In other studies the the samples were so small that there's really no validity. Also, especially in some of the genetic studies, the thinking was 
was considered to be unethical, if not totalitarian. Especially the genetic studies, they, like the Jukes, the Calicax, and and some of the uh, eugenic studies. Those studies were designed to show that that people of a certain, for lack of a better term, master race, were the ones that should be allowed to live, whereby other defective people should not be permitted to live. And so that ended up creating a certain amount of self-fulfilling prophecies, if not confirmation bias. And so you end up with theories that pretty much were confirmed the way the researchers wanted to. Now, with that said, let's shift our attention to something a little more recent. Some more recent biological theories have attempted to deal with the nature versus nurture controversy. And some of the, some of the uh, studies were primarily the, the product of better instrumentation. For example, brain disorders. We started, we're actually seeing more study with the use of the uh, computerized uh, tomography scanner or the CAT scan or the magnetic resonance imaging or MRI. And what they're doing is they're looking at the structure of the brain and the formation of the various brain anatomy to try to develop a connection between certain brain disorders and behavior. And in some cases, they've actually succeeded. For example, Huntington's Korea, it's spelled C-H-O-R-E-A, where it's actually been proven that because of certain brain abnormalities, a person behaves differently. Some of the other studies that were that are relatively recent in terms of uh, in, in terms of science are twin stu studies or adoption studies, where twins who are separated at birth and live with separate parents are followed over the course of their life and and the researchers are looking for any antisocial behavior or criminality. And they're finding out, at least as of right now, there's a greater likelihood of crime between monozygotic or identical twins than dizygotic or fraternal twins. Now, there may be something to this because an identical twin has identical DNA. A fraternal twin has different DNA. Another area of research is the XYY syndrome. And these are people who are born with an extra male chromosome. There's studies that are attempting to show a connection between that additional male chromosome and violent behavior. Of course, the studies aren't quite complete yet. And of course, dietary factors. For, and one such diet, dietary factor is low blood sugar. As I mentioned before, there's always the Snickers ad that says, you're not you when you're hungry. Have a Snickers bar. Also known as the Twinkie defense among, amongst the criminal de, uh, defense bar. Environmental factors are also being examined, especially in the areas of heavy metal poisoning, such as lead, thallium, and polonium and other, other metals. Hormone imbalances, which is at the heart of the premenstrual syndrome defense. And of course, various attorneys, along with their expert witnesses, are trying to show a connection between a hormonal disorder and antisocial or violent behavior. And then, last but not least, we have things such as behavioral genetics, and let me get this out of the way for just a second, behavioral genetics, evolutionary psychology, and neurosciences. So what they're showing, they're trying to show is that because of certain genetics, and evolution, there is an explanation for low IQ and impulsive behavior, and these are often often show up in in various psychological disorders, such as but not limited to ADHD, which is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ODD, which is oppositional defiant disorder, and lastly conduct disorder. 
And as you can probably guess, these particular studies are using children who are already under treatment for ADHD, ODD, and conduct disorder. Now, what the studies are showing currently is that is that people with ADD, ODD, and conduct disorder is has a predisposition to criminal behavior. Not criminal behavior itself, but they may be predisposed to it. With that said, what these studies have also shown so far is that there is not an identifiable crime gene. In other words, we haven't found any anything in our genetic makeup that shows that this gene is related to criminal activity or criminal behavior. Now, with that said, the studies currently show right now that there may be some contribution or genetic predisposition to criminality, but not to criminality itself. For example, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder may lead to more impulsive behavior where the behavior is not thought out and a child engages in that that sort of behavior without thinking through the consequences. The same thing occurs in oppositional defiant and conduct disorder. And so they may be more predisposed but not necessarily committing the behavior because of that particular disorder. Now, some more recent biological theories have also led to a certain amount of treatment. And because brain disorders were oftentimes connected to behavior, we saw a lot of prefrontal lobotomies, especially from the 1930s onward. We're not seeing quite so many today, but from about 1930 to a about 1965, 1970, the prefrontal lobotomy or the frontal lobotomy was, was a routine procedure performed in many psychiatric facilities. It became so routine that, that it was actually refined to the point where it was an out, where it was a outpatient procedure. And if you've ever seen the, the, uh, TV series on Netflix, I believe it's American Gothic Asylum you'll actually see a pretty realistic demonstration of a prefrontal lobotomy that was performed in an outpatient basis where, where the psychologist or the psychosurgeon actually took a long rod, drove it through the, through the person's eye socket and into the brain. And that was how lobotomies were oftentimes done in the, in a pre-hospital or a, uh, outpatient basis. Psychosurgery was another was another uh, method of controlling behavior believed that was caused by brain dysfunction. <clears throat> and it was basic it was popular from the 30s to the 50s. And this actually involved opening up the skull and either destroying parts of the brain or cutting off parts of the uh, corpus callosum, which is the network of of neurological tissue between the hemispheres of the brain. And this was believed to have controlled behavior. The problem was in both psychosurgery and prefrontal lobotomy, which is really one and the same, is that it tended to create people who were docile. And the problem with, with docile patients is that at that point, they're no longer of a particular use to society. And they, they find themselves in a the position where they are unable to care for themselves. These people were, would require institutionalization for the rest of their lives. Now, drug therapy facilitated bringing these people out into mainstream society. These people would generally be placed on a drug re regimen of uh, things such as Elevil, Wellbutrin, and so forth, where it would control their aberrant behavior, but at the same time, place them in a mental state where they could be productive, self-caring members of society.
Now, what a lot of these biological theories, while they have certainly advanced the uh, body of knowledge regarding certain biological causes of aberrant behavior or criminological be behavior, they do have certain flaws. Most of these particular studies were often based on small sample sizes. And usually those small sample sizes tend to come from incarcerated populations. People who were either in jail, in prison, or committed, civilly committed rather to a psychiatric institution. And so we end up with a lot of dualistic fallacy where researchers believe that there's only two kinds of people, and that is criminals or not. And the same thing happened, of course, in Lombroso and various other uh, old world or old school biologic theories. Now, it completely disregards the fact that there may be a large continuum of people who are mostly criminal, not, not that much criminal, or something like that. So, those... There were a certain amount of problems that were associated with those biological theories. Now, with that said, we come, of course, to psychological theories. And psychological theories, if you're gonna if you're talking about that, we need to talk about, of course, the granddaddy of all psychological theories, and that is Freudian theory. Freud did a number of things to advance the case of psychological theory, but I'm going to let this video do the talking. This is a thinker who helps us understand why our lives and relationships are full of so much confusion and pain. He tells us why life is hard and how to cope. His own life incurred a lot of anxieties. Sigmund Shlomo Freud was born to a middle-class Jewish family in 1856. His professional life was not an immediate success. As a medical student, he dissected hundreds of eels in an unsuccessful attempt to locate their reproductive organs. He promoted cocaine as a medical drug, but it turned out to be a dangerous and addictive idea. A few years later, he founded the discipline that would ultimately make his name. A new psychological medicine he called psychoanalysis. The landmark study was his 1900 book, The Interpretation of Dreams. Many others followed. Despite his success, he was often unhappy. During some particularly strenuous research, he recorded, the chief patient I am preoccupied with is myself. He was convinced he would die between 61 and 62 and had great phobias about those numbers, although he actually died much later at the age of 83. Perhaps because of his frustrations, Freud achieved a series of deep insights into the sources of human unhappiness. He proposed that we are all driven by the pleasure principle, which inclines us towards easy physical and emotional rewards, and away from unpleasant things like drudgery and discipline. As infants, we are guided more or less solely according to the pleasure principle, Freud argued. But it will, if adhered to without constraints, lead us to dangerous, reckless things like never doing any work, or eating too much, or most notoriously, trying to sleep with members of our own family. We need to adjust to what Freud called the reality principle. Though we all have to bow to this reality principle, Freud believed that there were better or worse kinds of adaptations. He called the troublesome ones neuroses. Neuroses are the result of faulty negotiations with, or in Freud's language, repression of the pleasure principle. Freud described a conflict between three parts of our minds. The id, driven by the pleasure principle, and the superego, driven by a desire to follow the rules and do the right thing according to society, and the ego, which has to somehow accommodate between the other two. To understand more about these dynamics, Freud urges to think back to the origins of our neuroses in childhood. As we grow up, we go through what Freud termed the oral phase, where we deal with all the feelings around ingestion and eating. If our parents aren't careful, we might pick up all kinds of neuroses here. We might take pleasure in refusing food or we'll turn to food to calm ourselves down, or we'll hate the idea of depending on anyone else for food. Then comes the anal phase, which is closely aligned with what we now call potty training. During this period, our parents tell us what to do and when 
to go. At this phase, we begin to learn about testing the limits of authority. Again, if things go wrong here, if we don't feel that authority is benign enough, we might, for example, choose to withhold out of defiance. Then, as adults, we might become anally retentive. In other words, not able to give or to surrender. Next comes the phallic phase, which goes on until about the age of six. Freud shocked his contemporaries by insisting that little children have sexual feelings. Moreover, in the phallic phase, children direct their sexual impulses towards their parents, the most immediately available and gratifying people around. Freud famously described what he called the Oedipus complex, where we are unconsciously predisposed towards being in love with the one parent and hating the other. What is complex is that no matter how much our parents love us, they cannot extend this to sexual life. We will always have to have another life with a partner. This makes our young selves feel dangerously jealous and angry, and also ashamed and guilty about this anger. The complex provides a huge amount of internalized worry for a small child. Ultimately, most of us experience some form of confusion around our parents that later ties into our ideas of love. Mum and Dad may both give us love, but they often mix it with disturbed behavior. Yet because we love them, we remain loyal to them and also to their bizarre, destructive patterns. For example, if our mother is cold, we will be apt nevertheless to long for her, and as a result, however, we may be prone to always associate love with a certain distance. Naturally, the result is very difficult in adult relationships. Often the kind of love we've learned from mum and dad means we can't fuse sex and love, because the people we learned about love from are also those we were blocked from having sex with. We might find that the more in love with someone we are, the harder it becomes to make love to them. This can reach a pitch of crisis after a few years of marriage and some kids. Freud compared the issues we so often have with intimacy to hedgehogs in the winter. They need to cuddle for warmth, but they also can't come too close because they're pretty. There's no easy solution. Freud says we can't make ourselves fully rational and we can't change society either. In his 1930 book, Civilization and Its Discontents, Freud wrote that society provides us with many things, but it does this by imposing heavy dictates upon us, insisting that we sleep with only a few, usually one other person, imposing the incest taboo, requiring us to put off all our immediate desires, demanding that we follow authority and work to make money. Society themselves are neurotic. That is how they function. And that's why there are constant wars and other political troubles. Freud attempted to invent a treatment for our many neuroses. He called it psychoanalysis. He thought that with a little proper analysis, people could uncover what ails them and better adjust to the difficulties of reality. In his sessions, he analyzed a number of key things. He looked at people's dreams, which he saw as expressions of wish fulfillments. He also looked at parapraxies, or slips of the tongue. We now call these revealing mistakes Freudian slips, like when we write thigh when we wanted to write though. He also liked to think about jokes. He believed that jokes often help us make fun of something symbolic, like death or marriage, and thus relieve some of our anxiety about these topics. There's a temptation to say that Freud just made everything up, and life isn't quite so hard as he makes it out to be. But then one morning we find ourselves filled with inexplicable anger towards our partner, or running high with unrelenting anxiety on the train to work, and we're reminded all over again just how elusive, difficult, and Freudian our mental workings actually are. We could still reject his work, of course, but as Freud said, no one who disdains the key will ever be able to unlock the door. We could all use a bit more of Freud's ideas to help us unpick ourselves. So, for all of its faults, Freud actually uh, contributed quite a bit to the study of criminology. And one of, the, one of uh, Freud's particular contributions was something called psych, psychometry, and I'm probably butchering the uh, pronunciation, or psychometry. And what psychometry is all about, it's about measuring psychological and mental di differences between those who are criminal and those who are non-criminal. And this gave way, of course, to various psychological tests, where things such as the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory uh, came about as, as a result of some of Freud's very early work in psychometry, where the idea was if we gave this person a test, 
then we could predict with a certain amount of validity that this person is going to become criminal or antisocial. So that's Freudian theory. And we've and of course we've already discussed the idea of the id, the ego, and the superego. Now it's often what Freud tells us is that oftentimes there's conflicts between the id, the ego, and the superego, and that results in uh, antisocial behavior. Now, there are other psychological theories that were out there, too, and, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time because, because this is really the province of, of our uh, psychology uh, program. But I'm just going to go over a few of them just to list them. Uh, there is, of course, introverts versus extroverts, and this was a theory that was put forward, excuse me, forwarded by uh, Hans Eisnick, and he claims that extroverted personalities are more delinquent than introverted ones. And I think that's probably more of a self-fulfilling prophecy than anything else. Now, Eisnick also claims that controlled anxiety reaction, or in other words, the fear of punishment, regulates people's behavior. And, of course, that's a throwback to uh, classical criminology. And then, of course, you have, you have B.F. Skinner, who came about with the idea of behavioral modification and operant conditioning. We're going to see that some European countries use operant conditioning and behavioral modification in an attempt to treat people with uh, sexual deviations, people who are who become sexual predators. And of course there's there is a certain amount of success that's related to that. Social learning theory theory comes from Bandura and this is where we where Bandura theorizes that we learn about being criminal from our friends. There's a lot to be said for that. Yokelson and Samenow uh, theorize that there is a criminal personality and that has to do with thinking patterns. Of course, this, will, this is the whole theoretical uh, basis behind cognitive behavioral theory or cognitive behavioral therapy. Cognitive behavioral therapy happens to be one of the most successful rehabilitation methods going today. And of course, intelligence and crime, we talked about that last week, where there's there is attempted to they attempted to find a connection between IQ and crime. And lastly, we have psychopaths, sociopaths, and antisocial personality. And then what they what each of these people have in common is that there are people who are inadequately, inadequately socialized. And these people basically were, were not properly socialized as children and therefore they engage in certain personality or rather certain personality disorders if not antisocial behavior. Now, we're going to see more of that when we start looking at other theories, such as uh, Gaffertson and Hershey's self-control theory, where, again, we start to see this relationship between socialization at a young age or structure at a young age and antisocial behavior. Now, with all the psychological theories that are coming, that are available today, it kind of opens the door to certain policy decisions. And one of those policy decisions, of course, discusses the insanity defense, where the courts have recognized that people may not necessarily be, be in total control of their faculties and may engage in antisocial behavior without being in control of themselves. Now, with that said, we're going to take a, a closer look at the insanity defense in just a moment. What is the insanity defense? I think there's a tremendous amount of misinformation and confusion about this. 
And I'll start with a principle that, uh, that I tell all of my students, and that's in one of the first pages of my book. And that is the mere presence, absence, or severity of any mental disorder does not by itself make a legal determination. That's very important because people think that just because someone has bipolar disorder, just because someone has schizophrenia, just because someone has an organic brain syndrome, that that means that they are insane. And that's not the case. So here are the criteria. There are actually two criteria that are used in the United States and most Western countries. One of them goes back to 1843. This is known as the McNaughton criteria. And it comes from a historical case where a defendant named Daniel McNaughton attempted to assassinate the British Prime Minister at the time. Instead, he wound, seriously wounded an undersecretary and was arrested and was found by a court of judges back in 1843 as suffering from a mental illness and being not sane at the time of the crime. And much like what happened after the Hinckley verdict, where people were incensed at the fact that John Hinckley was, was uh, acquitted not guilty by reason of insanity after attempting to assassinate President Reagan 150 years earlier, it was a hue and cry, and Queen Victoria herself convened a panel to determine standards for insanity. And they came up with the McNaughton criteria, which is still the standard used in about half of the states in the United States today and many Western countries. And what the McNaughton criteria says, that in order for you to be acquitted on the grounds of not guilty by reason of insanity, at the time of the commission of the crime, and that means not before, not after, but at the time you committed the crime, you you're, have to be mentally incapacitated. You have to have a, a, a defect of reason and, and behavior. And it has to be by reason of some mental disorder, by reason of some mental disease or defect, so severely impaired that you do not understand the nature and quality of your act. And even if you do understand that, you do not understand that what you're doing is wrong. So basically, the criteria are whatever the status is, it has to be the time you committed the crime. Because remember, you may be arrested and maybe a year until the, the case goes to trial. Now you may be fine. You may have taken your medication. You may have uh, recovered somewhat. But that doesn't mean you didn't have a severe illness at the time you committed the crime, or vice versa. You may be extremely disturbed right now, but maybe you weren't that way when you committed the crime a year ago. So you've got, you've got to go back and take a little psychological time machine back to the time where you committed that crime to determine what that status was. And at that time, your powers of perception and behavior and control have to be so impaired that you did not, and, and there has to be a disease or defect. And what the law means is you can't just say, I was impaired. There has to be a diagnosable syndrome. In order to qualify for an insanity defense under McNaughton, there has to be an actual syndrome that's been diagnosed by a medical or psychological professional. Schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, it has to be something that is recognized by the medical community. And so, and so that's the second criteria. The third is it has to be so, so severe that at the time you committed that crime, you literally did not know what you were doing. And even if you knew what you were doing, you didn't understand right from wrong. What that means is you did not know by the prevailing laws and standards of your society that stabbing someone to death was wrong doesn't mean that you just thought it was right. It doesn't mean that if somebody insulted you or stepped out with your wife or girlfriend or robbed you of money and you got so mad at them that you thought that they deserved to die that you decided to kill them. That's not what it means. It means that you literally, literally did not understand that society condemns stabbing and murder as something that's wrong. And if you think about it, that level of impairment is an extremely high bar to meet. There are very few conditions that make you that impaired that you literally don't know what you're doing and know that it's wrong. But we'll get back to that in a moment. Because the second standard is what's called the American Law Institute standard. And this only goes back to the 1960s. And that says, very similar to the way McNaughton starts, you need to have uh, a, your mental faculties impaired. It has to be some recognized disease or defect, otherwise known as a diagnosis. But here, the criteria is you did not understand the wrongfulness of your act. And that's similar to McNaughton, but where the ALI standard differs is in what's called the volitional prong. That is, it says, even if you did understand that what you were doing was wrong, you were not able to control your act. And that's different. If you think about it, the first criteria we use, McNaughton, doesn't say anything about your ability to control it. 
It simply says it's what's called a purely cognitive crime. It simply says that you didn't understand what you were doing, you didn't know that it was wrong. The implication is that you literally don't know what you're doing, but you, but you can't control it. But ALI says no, even if you know right from wrong, you know, there's a compulsion, you have no choice, you have lost your volition in being able to control your actions. And again, very few psychiatric disorders cause that level of impairment that a person cannot control themselves. So, a mistake that many of my colleagues often make is they diagnose or they see a diagnosis or they confirm a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, post-traumatic stress disorder, and so on. And they say, okay, well, that means the person that must have been the same. Well, what's very important for examiners to pay attention to is what happened during that crime. That's why it's very important to talk to witnesses, very important to get the defendant's re recollection of what happened, uh, read the arrest reports, read what's in the, the motions that the prosecutors bring, because, to put it mildly, just because you're crazy doesn't mean you don't know what you're doing. So, evidence that the individual planned the crime, evidence that they sought to cover up the crime, evidence that they sought to evade capture for the crime. I may have schizophrenia, but if I wait for you to come into the room for hours, jump on you, kill you, then try to dispose of the body and run away and not leave any evidence, that pretty much shows I know what I was doing, didn't it? It pretty much shows that I knew that it was wrong, because why would I run away? Uh, so again, it's very careful not to misconstrue having a mental illness with therefore being not guilty by reason of insanity. But it works the other way too, because remember, we don't want to give the impression that people with mental illness are all these potential crazed killers, because they're not. The, the rate of major felony commission, including murder, among people with serious mental illness is a little bit higher than the normal population, a little bit, but small. We're talking in 5 to 10 percent ranges. So it's not like we have to be afraid of people with mental illness. In fact, people with mental illness are far, far more likely to be victims of crime than they are to be perpetrators. So it cuts both ways. If you think about the different competencies that the law provides, we, if you're a, a otherwise unimpaired person over 18 years old, 18 years of age in the United States, you have a range of rights that you, you, you take for granted. You have the right to consent to, to treatment or refuse treatment. You have the right to make a contract, to buy and sell property, to get married, to get divorced, to raise children. Nobody questions these rights. In fact, if somebody wants to take those rights away, the burden of proof is, is, is on them to prove that you're not capable of doing these things. That's why these uh, people who say, well, I'm going to have you declared incompetent to take your, your rights away. It's not that simple. It's very difficult to do that. But by the same token, the law says, let's work it the other way. You have a responsibility to behave like a civilized person and obey the laws and rules of the society. And if you violate those laws, if you commit a crime, then you can't just sit back and say, well, I was, you know, I was impaired, so there's something wrong with me. I have schizophrenia. I have migraine headaches. I had a bad toothache. Therefore, I'm not responsible. No. Then the burden becomes upon you to show why we should not hold you responsible. And that's very important in considering the insanity defense in general and forensic psychology in particular, because they both deal with fundamental psychological, legal, and philosophical issues of responsibility, volition, and morality. <laughs>
psychological theory says, why is this person a criminal? Why, what is it in his makeup? Is it a, does he have a brain disorder? Does he have a chemical disorder and so forth? And as a result, positivism encouraged rehabilitation and reformation. And it, rather than simply killing people, which is what we, which in, in the days of the classical criminology theory, or the days prior to classical theory, that's what we did with felonies. All felons were killed. Uh, and so the idea was to create, back then was to create a disincentive. Positivism said, if we remove those problems, if we remove those, those disabilities, then this person could be a productive member of society. As a result, psychological theories often emphasize counseling and things like cognitive behavioral therapy, things of that nature. And so we started seeing the introduction of psychological treatment in prison, starting with post-World War II, with psychological testing of prisoners, and continuing to this very day. This is where we're seeing alcohol and drug rehabilitation and op and, psych and cognitive behavioral therapy. In Europe, you're seeing op uh, operant theory used with sex offenders. Now, there's also another policy shift that some people might think is a little punitive. Some people think that it actually is helpful, and that is that is, of course, civil commitment for sex offenders. Now, the idea behind civil commitment for sex offenders is the presumption that sex offending cannot be treated. And the way it works in about half the states in this, in this country that allow civil commitment for sex offenders, once the individual is released from prison, he is he is then tested and evaluated by the state's Department of Mental Hygiene or, or Psychiatric Health. And if that person is still deemed to be a threat to society, then he will be civilly committed to a psychiatric facility. But what does that look like? What you're going to see in the next few moments is you're going to see how the state of Washington handle civil commitment for sex offenders. This is the only way onto and off the island. Okay. This runs every two hours both ways. This island is where Washington State sends its worst and most dangerous sex offenders. They are deemed sexually violent predators whose crimes and personality disorders are considered so extreme that they need to be separated from society. Bill Van Hook has been in charge here for almost two years. So this is our central control room. This is where all the security operations are centralized and, and monitored. And do people try and escape? While this certainly looks like a prison, legally it's a treatment centre. But all 236 residents were sent here against their will, despite having already served their prison sentences elsewhere. And when they arrive, none of them have a release date. We are the first civil confinement facility for sexually violent predators in the United States. It was established in 1991. People who have served their prison sentence are evaluated at the end of their sentence, and if they're evaluated to present a high risk of reoffending, they're referred to prosecution to have them committed for treatment uh, at our facility. Forced confinement facilities like this are legal for people with mental abnormalities who are considered high risk, and only if treatment is offered, and if there is a chance of release. Nineteen other states have similar programs, and in 1997, the Supreme Court ruled that they were legal. Now, there's nobody here who walked in here and said, please pick me for, for civil commitment. And the way that they're now seeing the way to leave is, I've got to get involved in, in treatment. And that's how I'm going to get out. That's the only way they're going to go. 
Well, they can go out by dying, uh, which is not the preferred way, obviously. They can go out if they become so old and disabled that they no longer need to come to Earth. Justin, who asked that we only use his first name, began molesting children when he was a child himself. He was convicted at age 13 of first-degree child rape for molesting his half-sister for over a year. He spent five years in prison and ten more years here on McNeil Island. We're going to go to my room now, and I'm going to put my briefcase away, so... And the, the briefcase in the suit, is that is that for us, or is that for your attorney? I always like to dress appropriately, so... Yeah. I'm very festive. I like decorating. Like many sex offenders, Justin was himself abused. He was also diagnosed with ADHD and antisocial personality disorder. I'm both a victim of a sexual assault and a physical assault. And um, I, I, I will tell you that it took forever for me to forgive myself for what I've done. I got my, my siblings, you know, who, who, who I victimized. And it's like, you know what? I have something to prove to them. I need to leave them a legacy and say, hey, you know what? Justin is not this bad person anymore. So the predominant modality of treatment here is group therapy, but we also offer something called case management, which is up to an hour of individual therapy a month for each resident. Elena Lopez is in charge of the treatment program, which aims to manage residents' compulsion to the point that they are no longer likely to reoffend. This visual depiction helps them understand that certain things come from within inside ourselves and certain things are external to us that we still need to be mindful of. So the aim is to is to, to manage their urges and instincts rather than get rid of them. Absolutely. So the, the purpose of our treatment program is to manage their risk. Uh, it's not to eradicate or eliminate or get rid of, because most of our residents may always have a proclivity for, for deviance in some way, whether that's for children or non-consensual sex or other. Justin, who spent 19 years of his life incarcerated, eventually engaged with the treatment program, and is now convinced he will not commit sex offenses again. And so given the crimes you did commit, do you think you were born capable of committing those crimes? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So what, what do you think now you know, made you capable of doing those things? I, I would beg to ask the question what led up to, you know, being in an environment where I felt hurt, where I felt angry, where I felt rejected. But those are fairly common feelings for people to feel. You, you could feel those things again. Of course I could, but now I have different ways of dealing with them. You know? So you're managing your, your desires, your emotions, your reactions to okay. situations. Um, does that mean you still have desires about children? No, I don't. And I, no, I, I don't. It's just, I, it's just, it's, it's a weird thing. I mean, I, I don't have any urges towards children. I don't have any struggles about urges towards children now. I mean, I honestly, I'm baffled, you know, because it's like, I, I just stopped thinking about it. Whatever it was that worked, Justin has now convinced the state that he should be released. He's scheduled to get out later this year with major restrictions on the tree. Rachel Ford has represented Justin for five years. What, what benefit does Manila Island actually offer? No benefit at all. I mean, the, the treatment is better on the outside. The opportunities to reintegrate into society are better on the outside. So there's no purpose. If our society gets together and says, we want life sentences for all sex offenders, then we should just be honest about that and say that and change our laws. Your treatment has been proven to reduce reoffending rates, but 30 states deal with sex offenders without places like McNeil Island. There are no studies that show that the commitment is much more effective than community treatment. Wayne, who also asked that we only use a single name, repeatedly sexually assaulted young children and was convicted of child molestation and statutory rape. But after 13 years on the island, he's now been released unconditionally 
and he's studying to be a social worker. Are you still a paedophile today? I don't see myself as a paedophile, but I... You were convicted for multiple offences against children. Yes. Are you saying that at the time you had no idea what you were doing was, was wrong? I always knew it was wrong, okay? But my desire for wanting a form of intimacy and love, even though I learned later that's not what it was, but growing up in the abused background, I, I had a lot of conflict of messages, um, which are lies we tell ourselves to justify our actions or our behaviors. And I thought it was the truth that what I was doing was out of love. You're definitely no longer a risk. I feel that there's always potential for a risk based on what a person has done in their past. Okay, but it's what we do to eliminate those risks. I don't come down here normally and hang out a park when I know there's kids around down here. This is a park that gets frequent during the summer because I don't even want the appearance. You know, the reality is people can change. Even if serial child molesters can change, it will take a lot to convince the public that they are anything but monsters. Do you think this will exist in, say, five years' time? It'll be here for longer than that. And do you think there's, you know, there'll ever be the political will to close it? I don't know. It would be a tough sell. Now, if you remember, <clears throat> remember hearing about McNeil Island from other uh, classes, McNeil Island originally started out as a maximum security prison uh, for federal prisoners in the uh, t during the turn of the century. For, and now it's been converted into a lockdown facility. Now, if you'll notice, they also said that they're there, they didn't have too many escapes from there, and that, and that doesn't surprise me in the least, because McNeil Island was designed to securely hold some of the worst federal offenders that existed in the 1800s, early 1900s. Now, with that said, the reason why civil commitment exists is because, because of psychological theories of offending. Our best evidence to date shows us that that pedophilia and uh, sexual uh, deviance like that is a psychological problem and has to be treated as such. And so this is why roughly half the states in this country favor or use civil commitment for us, for sexual predators. The idea, of course, is to give them enough time and, and enough treatment to where they can become pro productive citizens. Now, it's quite likely that Justin will probably end up getting out in a few years, but when he gets out, he's probably going to have some restrictions, such as tether, uh, polygraph uh, testing, and so forth. So to wrap up this, this discussion of psychological theory, we've taken a look at positivist theory which basically tells us that that there are other motivations that are that are not necessarily related to free will or rational thought that there may be some other things going on and some of those other things that are going on of course are biological theories where someone there's something in their in the individual's biological makeup or there may be there may be some environmental causes that are for example, a heavy metal poisoning that may cause these particular antisocial behaviors. And of course, some more recent biological theories. Uh, we started out originally with atavism and phrenology and some of these really strange sciences to more recent biological theories such as, such as genetics and, uh, and toxicology and so forth. We've wrapped it up with certain psychological theories, and we've discussed the theory-policy connection. In other words, as I keep saying over and over, and I'm going to say it again, theory drives practice. Two examples of theory-driving practice, of course, are the insanity defense, which was discussed in depth and detail earlier, and civil commitment for sex offenders. The idea in both of those is that there is something psychological that causes people to deviate or to commit crime. 
and therefore they should not be held as responsible for their actions. Civil commitment takes it a little bit further where, where the state admits that, that that sexual predation is a psychological problem and therefore requires intensive treatment. And while this person is being intensively treated, he is to be segregated from society. So it actually combines a little bit of a mobilization with psychiatry. Finally, we come to the in-class assignment uh, part of this particular exercise. Now, this is going to be in the form of a Socrative exit ticket. Now, if you haven't done a Socrative exit ticket before, you would go to Socrative.com and you would log in as a student under the student login. You'll see a classroom num name and number. That classroom is going to be a series of letters. In this case, it's K A G V A B N P M. This particular exit ticket is only going to be open on Thursday from 8 a.m. to 11:59 p.m. The exit ticket is going to have three different questions. Now, the third question is going to be is going to be worded something to the effect of answer the instructor's question. Now, my question number three is going to read as follows. A blank is a brain operation used to control behavior. What I want is just the name of, of that operation. I don't, I don't need anything else, just the, just the name of the operation. Now again, you should complete this particular exit ticket no later than Thursday 11.59 p.m. because after that, this exit ticket is going to close and will not reopen. So again, the, the exit ticket is going to be is going to be your in class assignment for the week and it's going to count with as many points as a quiz so it's in your best interest to complete this now if you have any questions problems or concerns by all means you should contact me through email through text messaging or through the other various ways of contacting me that I've talked about in week 1 so with that, don't forget that there's also the, the quiz that comes up this week. We also have a, a discussion, which will be the third discussion of the series of four that's coming up, and that's going to be on the McNaughton defense. So again, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, by all means, contact me by text message, email, or what have you.